Tonight I'm pleased to introduce tonight's program with Dana Boyd discussing her new book, It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Networked Teens. Um, today is the actual publication date of this book, um, which also means that this is the beginning of the book tour. And I actually don't know what I'm doing on a book tour. Um, so hopefully you'll work with me and, and we can have a great conversation tonight. I'm going to give you a little bit of the context of this book, where it sort of comes from, and then I'll just do a little bit of uh, material from it. Uh, but really I want to get into a question answer conversation, um, because I think that that's actually where things get to be fun. So I was uh, of the first generation of young people who really grew up online. Um, my brother acquired a computer um, at a time in which it was really about basic programming and whatnot. And he was really interested in very sim in building very simplistic uh, games. And as a teenage girl, I was absolutely horrified that he might be using up the phone line to make these horrible beeping sounds that I couldn't understand. And I stomped into his room one day and I was like, what are you doing? And he sort of showed me that he was talking to all of these people online. And my brother, who I never thought of as the most social creature, I was just like, huh. Um, and sure enough, I quickly realized that the internet was made of people, um, and that made it a lot more interesting to me. So I spent my teen years in an, in an era of internet access where it wasn't actually seen as particularly scary or problematic. In fact, the idea that you were using a computer at all was seen as a good thing. Um, it must be educational somehow was kind of the main narrative of that day. Um, and so I you know, really got passionately involved with Usenet, which is you know, uh, archaic for a lot of people in the room. Um, <laughs> spent a lot of time, uh, you know, encoding a lot of the things that I post on there, mostly because I was afraid of what my mother might read. Um, my brother and I actually sh shared a handle online, um, so we kind of have this joke because we've never told my mom. Um, so it's like all of that material is still online. Um, and you know, we sat out and had a fabulous time. And then I went to college to study computer science in order to build the systems that I was so passionately involved with. Um, and then I ended up be so interested in the kinds of networks and the graphs that we started to see emerge. I was building these visualizations of Usenet, of email mailing lists. Um, and I realized that I was more interested in understanding people than building the technologies themselves. Um, and so I decided that I would embark on a study of what was emerging as um, social media. It was not That was not the language that was used at the time. Uh, and part of it was that in December of 2002, uh, 2012, uh, sorry, it's December of 2002, I received a phone call um, basically saying there's this new site out there. It was called Friendster, and people thought I might be interested in it. Um, I was like, that's fascinating. Mind you, it wasn't for another um, seven months until people started talking about social network sites, Friendster, um, in the media. So I got this great opportunity to study this emergent social media. And then I decided to go back to grad school. Um, and my advisor asked me if I was interested in trying to understand young people and their relationship to you know, new technologies, which at the time was all about Zanga and LiveJournal. And I was like, sure, I would love to do that. This would be fun. I'll get a break from all this new social network site thing. I'll go back to talking about blogging. This will be fantastic. Sure enough, as I started this project, we started to see young people engage with uh, MySpace. And I had this amazing opportunity to watch the rise and fall of MySpace and the rise and now fall of Facebook. And in many ways, this book is following those different trajectories, um, trying to make sense of what we understand, um, the kind of emergent social media, and in particular, young people's life in relationship to these new tools. Um, and so it's kind of interesting because, you know, especially trained under anthropologists, being able to actually watch full cycles was a really, you know, absolute delight. Uh, and when I went on this project, I actually imagined that um, things must be radically different because social media was everywhere. And that was a lot of my premise for studying this. Um, and part of it was because the internet was so transformative for me that it must be transformative for everybody else. And I was surprised and in some ways you know, was challenged to figure out that actually things hadn't changed that much. And that's where I'll sort of read the first um, passage which is actually from some field work that I was doing in Nashville. One evening in September of 2010, I was in the stands at a high school football game in Nashville, Tennessee, experiencing a powerful sense of deja vu. As a member of my high school's marching band in the mid-90s, I had spent countless Friday nights in stands across Pennsylvania pretending to cheer on the school's football team so that I could mostly hang out with my friends. The scene at the school in Nashville couldn't have, could easily have taken place when I was in high school, almost two decades earlier. This, um, it was an archetypal uh, American night and immediately led 
legible to me. I couldn't help but smile at the irony, given that I was in Nashville to talk with teens about technology and the changes in their lives. As I sat in the stands, I thought, the more things change, the more they seem to stay the same. And I started recalling uh, speaking to a teen named Stan who had met in Iowa three years earlier. He told me to stop looking for differences. You'd actually be surprised at how little um, things have changed. I'm guessing a lot of the drama is the same. It's just the format's a little different. It's just changing the font and changing the background color, really. He made references to technology to remind me that technology wasn't really the thing that was changing anything at all. And it was this moment of, of you know, taking, taking a step back and saying, what was this about the technology? What was this about the broader society that I was seeing? And a lot of adults kept coming to me being like, well, teenagers are so, you know, obsessed with their technology, with their devices, with their computers. They don't seem to talk to real people. Um, and that was actually the thing that I found so intriguing is that when you uh, spent time with teenagers and they weren't having to deal with their parents all over the place, they were more than happy to talk with their friends. They were more than happy to hang out. But of course, the moment that parents came along, it was like, hi, I'm going to go back to talk to my friends. And it might involve the device. Um, and so I started to think about what, what had really created this. And I started to realize that over the last 30 years, we've seen some amazing transformations in American society that in some ways are what's driving people's engagement with technology, particularly young people. So in the 1980s, we started to see the rise of curfew laws um, as this idea that the, the you know outside world was dangerous. We needed to keep young people at home for a variety of different reasons. There was a response to something that was referred to as latchkey um, uh, culture, which is the idea that kids would go home, gasp after school, and like actually be home alone, which was seen as an absolutely terrifying thing. So young people were really pushed into being very structured, especially in middle upper class environments. They spent all of this time going from morning to night um, in you know school and activities and activities and activities where they'd finally get done with their homework and it'd be 10 p.m. at night. Um, so you saw these kinds of things happen at the same time that 24-7 news created all sorts of new anxieties amongst parents that things must be so much worse out there. The world must be so much more dangerous even as all of the physical risks that were happening within society were actually declining. Um, and things had really, you know, but the anxieties kept growing, the anxieties kept growing, even as the things we saw kept declining. Meanwhile, you had a move to suburbanization and a move to um, the ideas of school choice. And what school choice has meant functionally for most young people is that their friends are likely to live pretty far away from them. Um, and that, you know, even if they could get on a bike, the ability to actually bike over to their friends' houses were heavily reduced. Of course, biking was in itself seen as dangerous, and especially in suburban environments where you might have to uh, cross, you know, a high way or even just you know cross a main road um, was seen as something that shouldn't be done so the whole thing that I grew up of you know get on your bike and be around your neighborhood was not something that I saw in most communities in fact most of the communities I visited it was like uh, no that's dangerous why would we ever allow our children out to do these things meanwhile you have this sort of pressure on two parents who have, you know, have to negotiate driving their kids to places, and it was all about driving their kids to safe places, which inevitably meant, you know, an, an older version of the play date. Um, and I thought, thought it was really strange that the play date had continued on into like teenage years, uh, because that was sort of the way of negotiating this. Teenagers themselves were, you know, who in my generation were so obsessed with getting access to um, a car and to driving had limited ex um, uh, opportunities to get access to their own vehicle. And even if they managed to get their license and managed to afford a car and managed to afford the gas, which was you know, a, a lot of ifs, um, they weren't allowed to drive with other kids in the car um, because we've seen so many laws against that. And so this dynamic of all of these pressures, these fears, these anxieties, these school pressures, these lack of mobility, meant that the ability to just hang out unsurveilled by adults had really radically changed. And then along comes technology. And guess what? But you may not be able to get together with your friends at the mall, but you can get together with them online. And you didn't have to even worry about trying to figure out how to sneak out of your own house, which was pretty awesome because, you know, there were no broken bones involved in this one. Um, and so we saw social media emerge at a time where young people could really participate. And in doing so, they started to build their own public world. Um, and it was really the rise of the early social media we started to see this nature and these dynamics of publicness. But of course, adults caught on. Um, and just as adults have tried to create gated 
communities and separate young people um, and sort of often under the guise of keeping them safe or you know different concerns that they that are more realistic um, we saw young people uh, sort of having this massive amounts of pressure that their engagement with social media um, was was surveilled and this idea that you know we should think about how to you know uh, restrict access for young people to social media and this this emerged at a time that I thought was really interesting because young people's participation in these very public fora created this understanding that like huh young people they must not care about privacy at all right why else would they spend so much time participating in these social media but of course anybody who has a teenager knows that they don't necessarily want to tell you everything they may tell you a lot and depending on your relationship it might be more than you even want to hear um, but the dynamics are not necessarily about saying everything and so that's actually where I get to um, uh, an anecdote from um, here in, in Boston. Um, I met a young woman named Carmen, um, and that's not her real name, but that's sort of what we'll call her. Um, and she sort of gave me an example of how she dealt with these very public environments. Um, actually, rather than reading it, I'm just going to tell you the story. Um, so one of the things about Carmen is that she uh, loved the fact that um, Facebook, and it was Facebook that was her thing at the time, she loved the fact that Facebook was this place where she could gather with all of her friends from all of these different worlds, including her large extended family, who was primarily Argentinian. And she loved that they would all come together in these powerful ways. And her mom was always commenting on things, and this was both delightful and sometimes problematic, because as Carmen pointed out, whenever mom would comment, you know, everybody would kind of disappear, right, after the mom comment, because it was just like, uh, not sure how to interact with my mom. But the challenge that Carmen had is that whenever she was having a really sort of emotional experience, something that was really personal to her, she would put something up online and she would struggle because she would want to share her emotions. But her mother tended to overreact about any emotional content that she saw online. Um, and so she was struggling because she and her boyfriend had just broken up and she wanted to tell her friends what was going on, mostly because she wanted their love and their support and their validation. Um, and so she was trying to figure out how to communicate this to her friends. Now, Carmen, of course, does what mo many teenage um, uh, girls think to do in terms of expressing their emotions. She was trying to find the perfect song lyric. Um, and the challenge she had is that if she put out a song lyric that was really sort of depressing, she knew her mother would overreact and think she was suicidal. It had happened before, and she was not suicidal. She was just having a bad day. She was, she was, she was racking her brain trying to figure out how she could communicate to her friends without tipping off her mom. Knowing her mother would not recognize British cultural references or geeky references, she decided to pull a song lyric from a film that she and her friends had recently uh, watched. And she pulled the song lyric up from Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Now for the geeky folks in the room, this is a song sung during the Monty Python skit, The Life of Brian. That song is sung during this, this scene in which the key character is being crucified. There is nothing happy about this scene, but the lyrics look so positive. And so she posts this onto Facebook. Her mother immediately comments, it looks like you're having a great day. <laughs> And her friends text her, right? And they're just like, oh boy, right? And it's this moment in which she has managed to convey a message encoded in plain sight. And I think of it as the notion of social steganography. Steganography being an old crypto term of what it means to hide in plain sight. And sure enough, Carmen had really figured out how to speak to different audiences simultaneously. And it was a beautiful, beautiful tactic. And one that I started to see more and more. As parents had sort of pa started paying attention to social media, um, young people started figuring out how to encode a lot of their content. And you'll start to hear things like subtweeting as a way of dealing with it. You'll see all sorts of references in, in, in different language for young people talking about it. But it often involves the use of pronouns because, you know, oh my gosh, can you believe what she said? Everybody in the peer group knows exactly who she is and exactly what was said. But no parent feels they can come and jump in and be like, so who is she and what has she said? That's just weird. Um, so you see this kind of encoding game playing out. And a lot of much more sophisticated ways of trying to manage a life uh, where you're dealing with these environments. Um, so this was sort of, you know, a beautiful moment where I realized that, you know, these tropes, these narratives that we would hear about how young people don't care about privacy or these ideas that young people are digital natives on the flip side are actually far more complicated than we might think. And I think that the goal in writing this book was to take 
take a step back, look at a variety of different concerns um, and issues, and sort of tease them out. And it's not so simple as to say that they are myths. Actually, they're almost all more complicated than one might think. And so each of these chapters in this book takes on a different issue that I thought would be really interesting you know, in light of a lot of public dialogue. So the chapters in here include a chapter on you know, what does it mean that young people are quote unquote addicted to social media? Do young people care about privacy? How do we understand online safety concerns? What are the issues around bullying? How do we untangle those concerns? Um, how do we understand young people's participation? Are they digital natives or digital naives? Um, and what does it mean that we often hope that this technology will be this amazing equalizer? Because I think another struggle that I encountered across all of this is that these dynamics are very much raced and classed. You know, the dynamics of privilege very much play out on here. And I sort of want to you know, sort of conclude and open to uh, questions in, uh, with starting by thinking about what it means that we get to see what's happening out online. So, you know, in our normal environments, we have, we live, we surround ourselves with people that are by and large like us. And what happens online is that we pile in all of these different environments. We get to see in the lives of so many more people, and that's both a blessing and a curse. And what I found overwhelmingly is that uh, adults in particular look into the lives of not just their own kids or their own community, but the world writ large and assume that they understand what's happening in their kids' lives. Or they look at some content that they, you know, a funny picture on Instagram and you think you know what's going on and you don't. Right? And these misinterpretations that happen over and over again. And what I started to realize is that the beauty of what's happening in social media is that it makes visible things at unprecedented levels. It makes visible the good, bad, and ugly. And we spend so much time getting anxious about the technology, getting concerned about the technology for, for sh uh, opening up this window, that we've lost track of the underlying dynamics. Not all young people are doing that well. Many of them are. Mo when they're doing well in everyday life, they're doing well online. But what's challenging for me is that those who are really, really struggling, they make it very visible in an online environment. And so it creates this huge challenge of how do we use this opportunity, this moment in time where we can actually see into young people's lives, see the complexity of what, what's going on, and figure out how to actually make a difference, how to step back as a community and, and participate and engage. And in that way, it's really complicated. It's complicated to look at all of this. It's complicated to not react with anxiety and fear. And it's complicated to appreciate the complexity and chaos of what's going on in young people's lives. But my hope and my goal for this book is really to provide a, a, a portrait of what's happening so that you know people can look and understand and appreciate young people from their own perspective. And I spend a lot of time in this book trying to make visible those voices that I've had the great fortune of being able to hear. And the hope is that with this book I can give back um, and you know make a little dent into the anxieties within our society and hopefully calm a few people down. And with that, thank you very much, and I thought I would open up to questions. Yeah. And by the way, I have to repeat them for the video, so be prepared. Yeah. Uh, when, you were, when you started talking, you said you just said about the rise and fall of MySpace, followed by the rise and fall of Facebook. Can you say what you mean by the fall of Facebook? Sure. Um, what is the next one? <laughs> um, so... What's been interesting is, is that in those different sites and serve, oh, the question was about uh, the rise and fall of, of MySpace, and I referred to the notion of the rise and fall of Facebook, and what do I mean by this? Um, different sites and services have fit into people's lives in different ways. Um, there was an era in which the notion of you've got mail was really exciting, and I would go home and be like, email, yippee, and think about all of the gifts that had sort of come down from the internet heavens, and this was fantastic. And now my relationship to email is like, oh boy, when you go home and you're like, I've got so many things to answer, so many things to deal with. And that doesn't mean that I have left email. I have very much not left email. Um, but the fact is that my relationship to email is very different than it was in that moment of passion. What has happened with a lot of the major social network sites is that, and particularly with Facebook, is that there was a moment in time where getting on Facebook was the coolest, funnest thing ever. And it was just too exciting to be there. And now for a lot of teenagers, it's just like, yeah, Facebook. Um, and that sort of emotional exhaustion does not mean that they've necessarily left 
left it, but its passion play is no longer there. And it makes sense for a variety of different reasons. You're on Facebook with everybody you've ever met. And right, who wants to hang out with all the people across all space and time simultaneously, including your parents as they're trying to be cool? Because that's just weird. Um, and so you start to see young people really engage with Facebook much more practically. It's the place to, you know, that you check in and you can see uh, or share a photo with everybody if you need to. It's a place where you know you can contact somebody and get somebody's cell number so you can text them. It's a place that, you know, you've had to interact with a variety of adults and you may not really like. And depending on a particular teen, they may still be there as a, as a primary site, destination site, or not. And what you've seen in this moment, um, and really sort of the last two years began it, um, but I think it's become, it's really ramped up you know, and it continues to ramp up, is something that I think is actually a much more natural state, which is the proliferation of a ton of different apps and services and sites where there's no next big thing. There's you know young people who are participating across a variety of environments from you know Instagram, where they'll do, you know they're engaged in photo sharing or Snapchat, right, which has different purposes you know for that. More interest-driven activities, we'll get to Tumblr or we'll get to Twitter, right. So that's where you might hang out with everybody else who's interested in fashion or everybody else who's like really obsessed with One Direction. You see that kind of dynamic. You see a ton of messaging services popping up amongst one's friends. You see, you know, these moments of being curious about what people in your network are saying. So you see things like Whisper.io or Secret or um, even Ask.fm. All of these things are happening simultaneously. And depending on which teen group you talk to, you'll see different cool sites and services. But I don't think we're pushing back to one major destination site. And I think that that's in many ways a more common, or, you know, a comfortable state of being. Yeah. Um, it can be assumed that, that teenagers today are some of the most prolific writers. Um, compared to past generations or recent generations, what kind of like implications of that is in your research? Are they becoming better at using the written word to share sentiment and to connect with each other? So the question was, um, are young people becoming better writers? They're, spending, they're some of the most prolific. Um, in history, how do we understand their relationship to it? Part of what's fascinating is, is that um we are so used to an oral culture as a way of, of everyday ephemeral expressions. And what happened when we started seeing a whole variety of um, textual media was that you had to write text co content in order to communicate, in order to, in many ways, write yourself into being online. And the, you know, from you know, my days in Usenet through, um, I would say, the early um, phases of social network sites, a lot of it was textual output. Um, and that textual output uh, challenged people because it was like, this isn't formal writing. And I, I still remember my grandmother getting very, very upset with me because, um, actually, more upset with my mother. When she called up my mother and was like, I don't think Dana knows how to write. Um, she seems to have these, these. it looks like words, but it's not words. <laughs> and I was like, no, Grandma, it's a different different story. And so part of what was challenging is, is there was a lot of expression through text, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's the same as writing. And of course, we saw a wide variety of this. You know, Young people who were blogging were very much expressing much more complicated narratives through this. But a lot of it was really ephemeral speech. I think that there's actually a really um, interesting moment that's happening right now where we're moving from textual expressions in the ephemera to actually visual ones. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, you've, everybody's got a camera phone on their device. You can take a quick picture, you can take a quick vid, and you can spread that. So what we're seeing is a shift from real textual culture to media, visual media. Um, and so I think we'll see those transformations. That said, I think that there is something really powerful of knowing that you have to be able to engage with text um, and or media in general. And I think there's a lot learned in those practices. And so for the cohort who came of age really participating in text, they learned to express themselves textually in phenomenal ways. One of the places where I'm seeing this very concretely is that I'm on the board of a um, service called Crisis Text Line, which is actually a texting hotline for um, young people who are in crisis. Um, and part of it was recognition that people were not actually calling you know, hotlines when they were in crisis, but they needed a way of expressing themselves. And we found that many young people, when they're not doing well, will be willing to express their emotions pretty extensively to counselors in a textual media. And so that's one of the reasons we've been able to see this as a switch. So I think that you know, the answer to your story is, is it's complicated. Like there is a lot more text 
textual engagement, but it's a lot more ephemeral. It doesn't guarantee that people know how to write in the sort of classic way, and that creates unbelievable numbers of anxieties that you've seen. But it doesn't mean that they don't know how to write. It's that they're actually participating in this as a communicative mode, and that we're actually in a mode where we're, we're transitioning. Um, and I think Snapchat's probably the most interesting of this, in part because, you know, the history of, of social media is like everything you put out there must be around for forever. And so there's this weird element where it's like, at first, like, oh, people are only sharing on Snapchat it's like things that they have to hide. That's like, no, actually, most of it is things you just don't want to stick around because it's not that interesting, right? It's just they're dumb. They're in the moment. They're funny. But there's something also really beautiful about Snapchat, which is that when I send you a photo, um, if I make you do it, on, if I do it on Instagram, you're scrolling, you're scrolling, you're scrolling, you might pay five seconds of attention maybe if we're lucky. But what's interesting is Snapchat is that I have to push down and I have to look at the thing that was sent to me. And that's actually a really interesting moment of also visual literacy where it's not just in the periphery, but it's a moment of paying attention. Other questions? Yeah. So I have a coworker whose teenager forgot to log out of her Facebook profile on the uh, on the computer she shared with mom, which was of course friends with all of her uh, friends fake Facebook profiles with their fake names, <laughs> all of which is completely against Facebook's policy. Um, how common is that and do you, do you have any comments on how teens generally are negotiating issues of identity and multiple identities? Right. Um, the question was whether or not uh, the process of creating fake profiles and fake networks was really common and how young people are negotiating uh, multiple identities. The fascinating thing was that um, the practice of creating uh, mirror networks, which is what I think of them as, is like, which is the idea of you've got your network um, on social media that your parents know about and that the teachers know about that has your real name, and you've got the separate network of the same people that you're connected to, but it's all of their fake accounts. Um, these mirror networks were extraordinarily common up until Facebook. So MySpace, universal, right? Like that was just like a guarantee teenagers were doing this. The reason that it was not common on Facebook was because it was really easy to slip up. And not only did you possibly slip up, but it, all it took was for Facebook to make a recommendation to your parents about this other network and you were in deep trouble. So you had to do a lot more effort to make this not visible. Um, um, than in previous kinds of systems. Um, but what ends up happening is, is, is that young people, in some ways, ever say, oh, these, these fake identities, they must be all about like you know terrible things young people are doing on the internet. Actually, most of it is just a place where you're not constantly surveilled. Um, and so it's a place where young people felt as though they could just sort of be free, not just from their parents, but from their teachers, from their, um, you know, from college admissions officers, from military recruiters, who were very much always in their business. And Facebook was a very funny one because of course it was born you know across the street um, and when it was at Harvard it was a trusted network of people that you knew and it was really comfortable and sure sharing your name because you were trying to get to know people on campus as it expanded further and further the whole culture of real names became challenging for a lot of people because it wasn't just you know about being visible even to your parents but the idea that college admissions officers were looking up everybody was just like whoa you know let me have my own space um, I know it's tricky also because I would say that parents have spent a lot of time saying that you need to make everything visible to us. And I think that's where it's been really challenging for a lot of teens who they just want a place of their own. Um, and actually, there's quite a few young people in this book who will talk about having you know, um, fake profiles, fake accounts, not because they're doing some crazy new kind of identity work, but they're just trying to have some sort of control over things. And I'm thinking in particular of a young man that I met in Austin. He was just like, his mother was always worried about everything. And so it was another one of those, his mother would misinterpret things. And he was just tired of having to explain and tell her to not worry. Um, and so he was doing absolutely nothing that would be even remotely seen as problematic, but he just needed a space of his own. And I think that's also where I would say, identity work is not done in a void. Identity work is not just about experimentation or like made up things. It's trying to figure out who you are within your social world. And when that social world is so heavily constrained by adults, it's really hard to make sense of who you are. And these things, you know, I would say we're going to see them, now that we're back to app culture, we're seeing it all over the place. You know, multiple Twitter accounts, multiple Instagram accounts, you know, all mixed up uh, and made a mess of things. It's a little different on things like Snapchat where it's just about being tied uh, to, you know, since it's so much more ephemeral and so much more one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the question is how I do field work. Um, 
So this has a really funny history to it, which is, like I said, I began this whole project really looking at social media. And there's some things that are really important to know in the history of sites like Friendster or sites like MySpace. First off, MySpace was a technical disaster. Um, it was built on um, Cold Fusion, for, for, again, for any of the geeks in the room, is a really horrifying thought of a not stable technology. Um, but the, And I say this having worked at Macromedia. Um, but the thing that was really, <laughs> I know it all too well, um, but the thing that was really interesting about the implementation of those is that <laughs> user IDs or unique identifiers were actually created um, in order. Right, in numerical order, which means that if you knew the entire range of accounts, you could do a random sample. Um, and that's actually what I used to do, is that I would actually log in every day and make certain that I was looking at random accounts and get a full random sample of the spectrum with MySpace. And that could be done with MySpace, and Facebook was a lot more technically sophisticated, so it was hard to do that. So I built out this beautiful map of what I was seeing in terms of content, and then I was thinking about how do I make certain that I can interview and engage people in light of what I was seeing um, in this environment. Um, and this project um, emerged and had sort of different pro time periods to it. So part of it was also getting through, for those academics in the room, getting through the Institutional Review Board, um, which was its own game of entertaining fun. Um, and so I actually spent a lot of time hanging out with teenagers in after school programs, volunteering, doing different things, listening and learning before I actually started formally interviewing, uh, before I started formally collecting data. When I went and started wanting to interview young people one on one, I, it was post the beginnings of um, moral panics about sexual predation online, I couldn't reach out to young people directly online. So I did in many ways traditional ethnographic recruiting. I spent time for this project in 16 different US states um, in a variety of uh, um, urban, suburban, and semi-rural environments. I hung out in all the public places that I could get access to that young people were hanging out in, which by the way meant a lot of really bad Mickey D's food. Um, and um, I would also spend time in schools, after school programs, I spent a lot of time you know, at football games and other sporting activities observing, talking to young people, and then I conducted um, 166 semi-structured interviews that were meant to sample across a variety of different populations based on the modeling that I had done um, through social media. Um, and then I would continue iterating um, and making certain that I was diversifying different young people's um, uh, approaches um, throughout all of it. So it was sort of this really weird project because it was in some ways a straight anthropological ethnographic project, but always complemented by um, having a lot of this information and material online. I also did a lot of content analysis over the years of any public media that I had access to, um, which was pretty amazing to be able to sort of go back and forth. And then when I would meet with young people, they would show me a lot of their online material and help explain what was going on because one of the things I quickly learned is that uh, I could not interpret anything. I thought I'd understand what something meant, but I had no idea. Um, and that was also part of the fun is being able to learn and hear the backstories and build that trust. Yeah. So um, I really liked it and I thought what you said, uh, I want to piggyback on what you ended with, with that question about the, op the opportunity and all this that we actually can see from these young people as they're going through stuff and, and we reach out as a community and full disclosure, I went to college with her and she was hilarious then and at her most hilarious when she was trying to make sense of all this stuff and what I think it's like, I, it, my whole question is about the end of the local. So when we were in school, you felt like you were in one community and whether you're growing up in Pennsylvania or I grew up here in Wellesley and you didn't have to think about the people in Newton, forget about the people in Pennsylvania. But now, so then if you're on campus at Harvard and your high school friend that went to Yale or whatever is on Facebook, so just the look, do, so the good thing is if you're the queer kid in, in some Alabama town, you can connect up with queer kids mm -hmm. around. But the bad news is you can't feel like you're in Alabama anymore. You're just always on the planet at all times. And uh, so you're, you're just part, so Dave Chappelle has his line, it's hard to situate yourself among seven billion. Yeah. So does that, how do the kids deal with that? Right. So repeating the question, um, the this question of like, you know, what does this do to the local now that you can actually be participating all around the globe? You know, as a teenager who spent my teen years really being around the globe and loving every minute of it, I assumed that young people would be engaging around the globe when I went on there. They're not. They're actually almost exclusively using social media to really engage with the people that they know every day. This is primarily about school. This is primarily about after school activities, summer camps, um, and uh, you know religious associations. Um, what I think is actually challenging is that they're not comfortable leaving those local communities. And so where I've seen the biggest challenge is actually thinking about college. Um, and military to a lesser degree, because military has structures that force you to leave. Um, 
but college, um, what I'd see is that young people would go off to college and they'd have such a vibrant network of friends from back home that they wouldn't go through the discomforting process of making connections in their new environment because they had such strong and supportive relationships back home and making friends is actually hard. Um, and that's hard, it's always been hard, this is not new. Um, and so it's been a big challenge for me because I see it um, twofold. One is you know, the staying connected to one's peers back home, particularly for young people who may have gone a larger distance. And the second is staying connected with mom and dad, um, which for the academics in the room, we also know that we get phone calls now from mom and dad um, sort of over every homework assignment, um, which has been a real radical change in this. And so it's both a blessing and a curse. Um, those relationships end up staying really strong, but there's not necessarily being thrown into the new local um, because the home local has become so strong. Um, I also think that this is important to realize um, what it means for the kinds of social engineering that universities do that in some ways we don't pay attention to. You are assigned a roommate in college that is not necessarily supposed to be your best friend. That person is often there because it's about showing you some other perspective on the world. And because we've spent so much time telling young people that strangers are dangerous and that people that are not like them are dangerous, we see a amazing discomfort um, in these university settings where young people are forced to encounter people that are not like them. Um, and so I think that we actually have to step back and question what, what that means for our conversations about a diversity, what it means about our conversations about making certain that you um, can make connections and build relationships to people who are uh, much wider and more different than you. And I think that the stranger danger conversation went too far in many ways because young people really they they bought it like they didn't talk to strangers and I'll sort of one more example since you brought up the LGBT issue um, that one was a very personal one for me so for you know a lot of us who are queer youth who came out online the internet uh, was an amazing opportunity as teenagers it was an amazing ability to connect to people around the globe to feel like you were okay. Um, when I went back into the field, um, what I kept hearing from queer youth was that like they would never talk to strangers online. Like why would they? And you know, even when they themselves were really depressed, even though when they themselves were really being harmed um, in person, because they were convinced that the strangers were far more dangerous um, than than their peers. Um, and even though many of their peers were so much more abusive, um, and the place where I saw this and has been at its most heartbreaking, and the, the piece of data that I've still not been able to figure out well um, has to do with Dan Savage's um, sort of it, uh, it gets better campaign so because young people were so like not wanting to talk to strangers when the it gets better campaign came along a lot of young people were like I'm gonna participate in this this is gonna be this amazing place to connect and I saw teenagers around the country make videos of it gets better so telling their own story expecting that they would find community and support and rather than finding community and support in that environment in an environment where strangers are dangerous what they ended up getting was chastised and harmed back home um, and I would say for a lot of young people it actually made things much worse rather than much better and it was really hard for me to track because a huge number of LGBT related suicides in the following year were of young people who had referred to making videos and things getting worse and so this is where I really struggle with these moments because those online communities can be really valuable but you need to know that you're connecting to a person and in the light of stranger danger we have so heavily discouraged young people from connecting that they don't get the support that my cohort really, really did. And that's a really uplifting topic. Hi. Hi. What are your thoughts about how teachers can utilize the, the use of social media if they should be? Or is that that should be a space that's more kind of protective for Right. So the question is, um, what is what, what can teachers do? How can teachers engage with this? Or should it be protected for, for youth use? You know, in the early days of social media, before there was um, principals and law enforcement officers telling uh, teachers that they should not be on social media, a lot of teachers really were on social media. And what was really interesting was how many powerful conversations teachers had with young people about that. So in this book, I um, refer to a particular uh, uh, story that I sort of got to watch unfold, which is a story of a teacher out in um, the Bay Area um, in a working class environment, and I'll call him Mr. C. 
And Mr. C had created a MySpace profile. It was of that particular era. And all of his students had sort of friended him. And he was like, OK, I'll be friends with you there. But I'm, you know, I'm staying out of this, but I'll be friends. And then they started writing all these comments on his, on his profile. And one of them that was amazing to watch unfold was this young woman who was like, yo, Mr. C, like, why am I learning trig? Like, my parents don't know trig. Nobody around me knows trig. What is the point of any of this? And the teacher came back and said, you know, I appreciate this. You probably think that Shakespeare is useless, too. Um, but the way, the reason we're teaching you these things is we're trying to help you think and learn and be exposed to different understandings. You may not use trig, but it's actually still valuable, and here's what's going on. And all of these students started piling in, and all of a sudden, a whole conversation about pedagogy unfolded on this teacher's um, profile, which was just unbelievable. And it changed his dynamics with his students for the next month, because they were willing to engage with him about what he was learning, or what they were learning, and what he was teaching. And so it was this great to see this kind of dynamic. As we started to see teachers be you know, pushed off of social media because they weren't supposed to participate, it wasn't actually students that were pushing them off. And so you know, the advice that I've long given teachers, which is completely antithetical to Facebook's um, you know, uh, you know, ways of, of acting, is create a teacher profile. A teacher profile that is purely you as teacher on whatever major social services there are. Never friend a teenager, because that's awkward and weird. Um, but if a teenager writes back to you and, and friends you, say yes and stay out of their business and be there and be supportive and if you see something that's you know weird or bothersome you can sit there and see them the next day and go <coughs> by the way you know I'm on this site with you right and then of course they're like oh okay and there's a, a change of a conversation the reason I think that this is important and I would say this is not for every educator because every you know teachers bless them you know are dealing with so much overwhelming realities but it's a matter of what it means to create a community and we've gotten to a point especially in upper middle middle class environments where it's only custodial parents that have meaningful interactions um, between young people uh, and adults. And actually, we need to create a whole community of adults that are really a part of young people's lives um, and not there to always be the, you know, the rule maker, but there that's just generally present. This is also generally advice I give to parents is like build an entire network for your youth of other adults that are in their lives, whether it's their cool aunt or uncle, their older cousin, the cool coach, whoever it is, people that'll be present. A lot of young people will invite them into social media, and then they can be there and be supportive. And that's pretty phenomenal. Now, in terms of whether to use this formally educationally, you know, generally, don't, don't use any technology if it doesn't fit into the pedagogy, right? Like, this is, I think this is a, you know, a dangerous thing we do as ed with, in an education environment. So we, we focus on whatever is the new hot thing, and we're like, we'll put it into the classroom. It's like, no, it doesn't fit there. Um, but, there's, but also recognize that is, there's tremendous amounts of learning that go on in social media, and it's about acknowledging the learning, which is different than trying to make it, quote, unquote, educational. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. It's cool. very fascinating. Um, I'm interested in um, if you wouldn't mind speaking more to the racial and class um, contours of this project yep. and, and just some of your findings, um, especially in um, urban areas. Yeah. So the question was um, if I would speak to a lot of the um, racial and class you know, dynamics um, of the project. Um, I want to start with uh, a situation that I ran into, which was sort of in the middle of the project. Um, in 2006 to 2007, um, which is where we started to see the rise of Facebook for worlds outside of college, uh, we started to see young people split between these two environments. They were on MySpace or they were on Facebook. And at first I was like, this is fascinating. Like, why are some people choosing one or the other? Um, and then I had some intense conversations with teenagers, including one that, was, that occurred not too far from here in, in in the greater Massachusetts area, um, of a young woman sitting down and saying, you know, I don't really mean to be racist or whatever, but you know, my space is kind of ghetto. And I was like, huh, what does that mean? And as I dove into it, I started looking at what was happening. I realized that the media language around MySpace had positioned it in race and class terms. It had pos positioned it as the urban, as the, as the dangerous, as the um, you know, you know, risque place. Whereas Facebook had been held up as like safe and quiet and private and protected. And this tension had played out in young people. And as they moved between these two sites, what became really visible 
school is just how raced and classed young people's networks are. Um, and so I started watching this, you know, over years. And mind you, I, I posted you know, a really uncomfortable blog post about you know my observations here, um, which one of the challenges about blogs is when people misinterpret them. So the BBC picked it up as a formal report from Berkeley, which is the best way to get into massive amounts of trouble. Um, and I got slammed, and I got slammed in every which direction. And representatives from both MySpace and Facebook, namely lawyers from both MySpace and Facebook, called me up with starting to critique me for you know destroying their reputation and brand. And I was like, this is fascinating that both of them are calling me up. That's intriguing. Um, and so, and adults were attacking me for for being racist. But overwhelmingly, the teenagers kept coming and being like, you're right, here, let me explain to you what's going on. You don't fully understand it. And they actually mapped this out. So I started to see these splits. And these splits happen now on every major social media. What you start to realize is that young people's participation on these sites is with the people that are like them. So even if they're all on a service like, say, Twitter or Tumblr or one of these, they're in their own worlds. And the norms and what spreads through those worlds are very much you know, affected by those peer groups and what happens. I suspect as we see a lot more app culture, and we're already seeing some fragmentation across race and class, and I think that this will just get magnified. What was challenging to me during this MySpace and Facebook tension was that you kept hearing college recruiters being like, we're going to use social media to reach out to young people. Yeah, we're using Facebook. No, we're not looking at MySpace, which was also really interesting when you think about the implications there. Um, you also see an amazing amount of racist language when young people run into each other in ways that they don't know how to deal with. Um, so for example, I recount in here, uh, what happened the night of the BET Awards um, in 2000, I want to say it was 2008, I may be wrong on that, don't quote me. Um, where what happened was that uh, all of the trending topics, it was the first wave of trending topics, were all icons of the black community. Um, and so countless numbers of, of young people would reach out and just be like, make racist comments um, a, a around this. We certainly saw this with actually what happened when Hunger Games came out. Um, the idea that one of the key characters was black was, was shocking to some young people and you saw this very racist language. The reason I point this out is that these dynamics of race and class aren't just about differences of youth, of use, but about these narratives that we have in a so-called so post-racial society um, where what we start to realize is that because young people have been socially, structurally um, kept within groups of sameness, they don't always know how to encounter a difference online. And I think that's been really challenging to watch. In terms of actual practices, one of the things that's been interesting about social media is that it's been used broadly. Um, now, some of it may be more mobile only. Some of it may be more picture oriented or more hashtag oriented or you know, this, that, and the other. And those contours make a, make a difference. But engagement is you know, unbelievably, you know, across all youth um, in pretty significant ways. And the, the details vary, but the participation doesn't.